Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome into another video. Today I'm going to do something quite a bit different. I'm going to show you one of the knives that I've made. And it's something that I've kind of avoided doing for quite a while now, and I've gotten a lot of requests both here from my YouTube subscribers as well as people on Instagram saying, hey, you should really showcase some of the knives that you make on your YouTube channel. And the reason I haven't done it is it feels rather self-serving. Now, I know with online personas and everything else, unless you really know me, I'm actually, I'm actually kind of a humble guy, and I don't really like to talk a lot about the things that I do. However, enough people have asked me, and because I'm such a harsh critic on myself, it took me this long to cave into that and to finally show you one of my knives, because this is one of the ones that uh, I'm the most proud of. I put a lot, a lot, a lot of work into this knife, and uh, I kind of wanted to show everybody and give everybody an idea of what this model is all about and talk about some of the options that I typically offer. So what this model is, this is called the Advanced Tibia. Now, the reason why it's called the Advanced Tibia instead of just the Tibia is because it's actually based on my original Tibia model, which is my Warncliffe model that you see right here. And one day while I was making a set of, I don't know if it was three, four, five tibias, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to break away from that standard uh, straight edge worn cliff that just came down at one angle. I wanted to make something uh, drastically different. So the handle remained the same. Uh, I have since changed the handle on the tibia to something a bit more simplified, not so many finger choils. But the handle at that time was the same. Um, I decided to grind this upwards, start bringing the, the top of the, uh, the spine of the blade downward from the handle area down and then bring in this extra peak here. On top of that, I wanted to add a little bit more flavor by adding an extra set of grinds. So you have the primary bevel, you have what would normally be a top swedge, but, um, and this is completely impractical, it has no practical purpose, but I wanted to take that swedge and make it so large it was almost like another uh, primary bevel sitting up on top so each blade is ground uh, with four bevels so you have two on each side another thing is I decided to do I wanted to add a forward finger choil and by doing that it reduces the cutting edge but it allows you to choke up so far on it that you've got greater control over any of your cutting tasks so I've added the jimping up top, which I'll show you very quickly here. A little hard to see with the damascus steel pattern, but there is the hand file jimping. So overall, this actually came out to be one of my favorite models. It's the most aggressive looking design that I've done. And while the grind is impractical in the way that it's executed, as far as cutting with it, obviously you've got a, a very clean cutting edge and very simple to cut with and a nice sharp pointy stabby tip. So what you're looking at is 7 inches overall. Um, from the front of the scale to the tip is 4 inches. I don't want to call that 4 inch blade length because you have this dead space here where the finger choil is. What you do have for a cutting edge is 3 inches. Now with the regular tibia you get a lot more cutting edge obviously because it goes all the way back to here. So you get just about a 4 inch uh, cutting edge on the regular tibia. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you're looking for something that um, is a little bit more aggressive and wild and different, the advanced tibia is the way to go. Now, just like the tibia, um, I typically offer these as a standard in CPM 3V. And the reason I do that is because that was a worn cliff, and, and this still is a worn cliff, it was made to be used where you could kind of chop with it, even though it's a small knife. I mean, you're not going to go out hacking up wood, but anything that you might be doing chopping with it, I wanted to have a stronger edge. Most of my knives are either in S35 VN steel or they're in CPM 154 CM. And those are great for EDC. They're nice and corrosion resistant. They hold an edge a long time and they're easy to resharpen. But with 3V, you've got the option of, yes, still great edge retention, but it's a little bit tougher. You're less likely to roll the edge, chip the edge, 
or uh, really deform the edge from most cutting tasks. It also helped with malformation of the tip if you were to actually stab into something. Um, actually, one of the knives I hand delivered recently, we were playing around with it and uh, stabbed it into the wooden table that we were sitting at. And obviously, no uh, tip deformation because it was 3V. So this one I decided to go quite a bit wilder. Uh, this is the Odin's Eye Damasteel. Those of you that have been with my channel a long time know that I am a huge, huge, huge fan of Damasteel. It is my favorite type of Damascus. It's a cleaner steel. Even going back to when you, when you receive it in bar stock form, it's very clean. Uh, it, it looks like it's ready to just be polished and sent out on its way as it is. I absolutely love the steel. Um, on top of that is Carbo Quartz Scales. Carbo Quartz is a new type of material. A lot of people haven't seen Carbo Quartz yet. Only a handful of makers have been able to get their hands on it and work with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Peter Carey was really the first one uh, to receive Carbo Quartz and to do work with it. And obviously, I mean, it's Peter Carey. The work is flawless and it looks amazing and it made a lot of us want it. And it, when you grind it, when you first get it, it, it it's either black or it's white. <clears throat> and the whole thing is white on this particular set. And as you grind it and contour it, it's almost like looking at multicolored G10, like a blue and black G10. And when you start contouring into it, you expose the different layers. And you can see the layers here, we can get the camera to focus, of the carbon and of the quartz. And as you start to contour it down, you'll expose uh, either splotches or rings or however you choose to do it. As I was grinding through this, I liked the look uh, that I was getting by just having the rings going around and the three patches. Instead of, you'll see some that have look, what look like random splotches. You are able to control the, the final look of it by how you're contouring it. So the way that I chose to go ahead and start my, uh, my pre-contouring before I started doing the hand sanding allowed me to expose the, the same amount of rings all the way around and to control that look. And then the further I went down into the material, the more of these patches that I was able to expose. And then as I was doing my hand contouring, you know, you kind of pay attention to where the pattern is falling. So you don't want to go too much more here because you start taking away some of that pattern. You don't want to go too much more here because you're going to introduce more rings. So it's a little bit more of a controlled thing. Now it's no more difficult to grind or to work with than carbon fiber or G10 or anything like that. But if you're going for a certain look, if you take your time, you can control the outcome of the material, which I think is pretty damn cool. The problem is it is extraordinarily expensive. The material was actually created in the watch industry uh, for Richard Mille watches. It's only made on one autoclave in the world, and I believe it's in Switzerland as well. So they have control over that, and they're the only ones that have it. And they make cases for their watches out of this material, and the watches that use that, I believe the starting price is either $125,000 or $135,000. And that's the only place that this material had existed. Well, a little over a year ago, uh, James over, or excuse me, Jim over at uh, Carbo Quartz, he wanted to bring this, uh, because he's a watch collector and he's a knife collector, he wanted to bring this material into the knife world, and he spent over six months to get permission to import this product to introduce it to the knife world. So when you get it, uh, the piece that I have, and I, you can see this on Instagram because there's a price sticker on every one, the piece I had was about like this. I have enough left over for after doing these to do a small set of bolsters at some point someday. That was $300. I'm sorry, in the white it's $400. The black I think was $300. Anyway, one of them was $300, one of them was $400. That puts this as expensive to work with, or maybe even a little more so, than Timascus or Mokutai. So this obviously is a very, very expensive knife. The bar of steel this came off of was a little over $300. When I break it down, this is about $130, $140 worth of steel, plus almost $300 worth of materials. Uh, when I put my knives together, I don't use Corby bolts or any kind of cheap pins or anything. These are actually titanium, Stephen Kelly titanium pivots. And that allows the end user uh, to order 
multiple sets of scales they can unscrew them and put a different color on different shape on whatever they want to do however we decide to make it and just screw it back together so it costs me twenty dollars just to simply screw my knives together so when people look at the cost of my knives and go I don't get it well each of those pivots is nine dollars and eighty five cents so yeah it takes twenty bucks just for me to simply screw my knife together when I could have been using about twenty cents worth of pin stock or maybe a dollar's worth of mosaic pins or uh, four dollars worth of Corby bolts you know the list goes on and on that's just how I choose to do it the d most difficult thing about dama steel and why I don't this is the very first dama steel knife I've done and why I won't do a lot of them is the fact that you have to do a certain degree of prep this knife has at least six hours worth of hand polishing to get it to this level so the first thing that I did I've, ch I've changed how I do things since I started making this knife uh, I actually do all of my flat surfaces and all of my outer edges I do all that finishing before I grind my knives but when I first started this knife I was doing it the other way so I ground the blade so each of the four bevels were ground all the way up starting progression 60 grit preheat preheat treat grind uh, 120, 220, 400, 600, 800, 30 micron, 15 micron, 9 micron. All of those individual belt progressions for each of the four bevels. Then once I was done with that, went to the buffer and gave it a polish. After that, I had to do the exact same progression all the way around and all the flats. So you have to bring Damasteel to a perfect mirror polish if you want the proper results from the material and because I had never worked with it before uh, I'm very fortunate that I live local to Todd Begg Todd has moved to Dallas here in the past year and Todd is one of the handful of knife makers that has really mastered the art of working with Damasteel he doesn't get just tones of gray he gets a nice deep dark etch a great contrast and that was what I wanted so he was gonna teach me how to etch it so I went over to the shop a couple days ago with, uh, with the work done, and in my mind it was ready to go. And he was looking at it, and uh, I could tell by the look on his face that it wasn't quite ready. He says, I'm still seeing a lot of scratch marks in the grinds. He goes, you've got the polish, but you're polishing over those uh, scratch marks. I said, well, you know, I've sat down with sandpaper on, on all this knife, and I just can't quite get it to where it needs to be. And then he showed me a few tricks, things that he does. And he will spend hundreds of hours on certain knives hand polishing very precisely and very meticulously. So I sat down for pretty much two-thirds of the entire day in his shop using his method to bring this to a perfect mirror. And I mean, it is a flawless mirror. Uh, went up with the stones and paper all the way up to 2500 grit and then after the 2500 grit quite a bit of buffing and that gives you that base of a perfect piece of steel to then etch and then he taught me some very specific uh, little tricks about the etch to get the desired effect and to get this great contrast and I honestly I am so indebted to him for taking the time uh, to teach me all these great things so that I can make such a, a beautiful looking knife. So that's pretty much it about the knife. Uh, it's going to be packaged in a Pelican case for the customer. This is a customer order. It's not available. And uh, it'll be in a Kydex sheath very similar to this one. Uh, you guys saw this knife. This was the uh, the first knife that I freehand hollow ground from, uh, from nothing to completion. Uh, very, very happy with how this turned out. This was the collaboration I did with Mike Stewart over at Ecom Knives, my good buddy and uh, I've actually turned this into one of my EDC knives but this is the uh, the style of kydex that the uh, that this knife is actually going to be in because the customer does want to be able to carry it and I love that love the fact that it's not just going to sit in some kind of showcase he's actually going to be using it oh back to the jimping a lot of people ask when I show the jimping um, how I do it the file that I use it's a uh, Swiss checkering file uh, it's double lot coarse and it's either 30 or 35 lines per inch I don't recall I've had the thing for about a year and I, I just I just don't remember uh, exactly which which fineness I got so it's either uh, yeah 30 or 35 lines per inch 
But the double lock course is the most important thing is you want to really be able to cut into that steel. And it's just bitey enough that you can feel it, but it doesn't tear up your skin. Uh, you guys know I'm big on jimping and it's got to be done right. And, well, I had to adopt that into the knives that I make myself. So that's pretty much it. I think I've given you a 360 degree view, but if not, let me just go ahead and do it again real quick here. So you can see the beauty in the pattern. And you can start seeing a little bit better how I grind this. I grind the primary first and then I grind the top grind last so that I can sweep it down more toward the tip. Some of them I bring all the way to the tip. Some of them uh, customers want more of a 50-50 look so I grind that first. Then I grind the primary and that just gives a straight line going across. It's really up to what the customer wants. This Odin's eye pattern is so sexy. There's that gorgeous carbocortz. Cool stuff, man. If you're going to work with it, um, I would definitely suggest that you grind it wet. Do make sure that you grind it wet. Pattern coming through the spine. Pattern in the tip. And there's the back side. The only thing that I'm really changing right now about the advanced tibia, I just made two more. I'm in the process of making two more. They're out to heat treat. A uh, couple in 3V and a couple in Damasteel. The only major change is I was really scared when I first started grinding this knife to bevel this out so that it was a little bit softer on the fingers. So this is still square from the bar stock because you know throwing that thing up against the small wheel and trying to get it just right I didn't have the confidence in it yet because I hadn't really done it and I sat down the other day when I was grinding out those four and I went you know what I just need to do it and see how it comes out luckily it did and for, so from this point forward that area there is going to be uh, softened a little bit just to make it a little bit easier if you're doing hard cutting obviously in, in the damage steel this will never be used for super hard cutting chores so you're not going to bear down super tight and it's not going to be torquing in your hand that you've got to worry about a little bit of a harsh edge but you know what I, I have to look at it the same way that you know, I critique other makers' knives. That's what I've done for the past five years. Um, I have to look at those things. And one of the things that I do often critique is if someone leaves any harsh edges on their knife that my hand is going to come in contact with. So I can't knock somebody else for it and then go and do it in my own damn knives. I have to hold myself up to that same degree. And uh, speaking of that... Um, I'm very, very happy to announce that when I went to the Kansas City show recently, uh, which is the Knife Makers Guild and ABS show, uh, I was able to, thanks to uh, my wonderful Kydex guy, who happened to be in Kansas City, I would sent him 16 knives, uh, he found out I was going to be there and that I was, I was told I really should have brought knives to have inspected to get into the guild. He was chatting with me and he grabbed four knives literally at random, stuff that was just going out to customers. They were not made to be judged. And uh, he grabbed four knives at random, ran down, and uh, I was able to get my four signatures after the four different judges inspected. And uh, so that's a, that's, a major, that's a major thing for me to, to gain that kind of acceptance. I just started making knives. Right now, this is October 2017. I started full-time in January, so 10 months. 10 months I've been making knives full-time and to um, to be accepted like that into such a prestigious organization and, and look at the people that uh, next year when I'm there with my own table selling my own knives, to be sitting next to people that uh, that have done so many amazing things and advanced this industry so much, it's a big honor for me. So uh, thank you to all you guys that congratulated me when I announced it. Uh, it's, it's a very big deal for me. Now, not every knife I make is going to be this flashy. As a matter of fact, my favorite combination usually on this is just uh, all high satin with carbon fiber scales. You know, it's, it's a pretty clean looking deal. Um, that runs anywhere from with, with a sheath, you know, about 475 ish You know, it depends on, you know, how fine the finish we're going up to and, you know, how expensive the scales are going to be. But a standard finish with carbon fiber is about 450 475 So something like this goes up obviously well over a grand because 
you know, there's over $500 worth of just raw materials here before ever being touched. And then, you know, 15, 20 hours worth of work into it. So, you know, that's, that justifies the cost there. But anyway, I wanted to kind of show that to you. I know I'm rambling because I'm nervous. I don't like... I don't like patting myself on the back. I don't like sitting out here and, and somebody misunderstanding this and going, well, Jim just thinks he's the greatest knife maker in the world, showing off his little knife there. That's not what this is. It's people have wanted to see them and see a closer look than what I post on Instagram. Uh, and I wanted to be able to do that and, and show you guys the progression that I've made now over the past several months. And uh, those of you that have supported me, uh, the customers, and the incredible amount of amazing knife makers that have uh, stepped up to support me and help me out and just just kind of be in my corner uh, it really has been amazing and I, I could not have done any of what I'm doing without uh, people like Jerry Moe and, 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 and Todd Begg and uh, the support from guys like you know Rick Barrett um, uh, Doc Schiffer uh, Bill Koenig, it was just so many, Bill Coy, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just going to start forgetting people here, so I'm going to stop, but so many amazing people that have just kind of been cheerleading me on and, and saying, hey, try this and do that, and a uh, big thank you to John Gray that uh, let me know as I was getting ready to cut into this that I should be grinding it wet before I started grinding it, that probably saved me a hell of a lot of headaches and chip outs and everything else, so um, anyway, I'm going to stop rambling <laughs> at some point. I will show you my other models. Uh, I do have several that I make now. You can see everything that I do over at SkeletonCustomKnives.com. The only model I don't have up there is my newest. It's a little guy, a little neck knife I call the Little Finger. And uh, I'm getting ready to start a new run of those. So if you want to get one of those, check my Instagram. You will not miss those pictures. Uh, otherwise, you can email me and I'll send you some pictures. I'll update my website at some point soon. And those started 275 bucks in, uh, in S35VN in carbon fiber. So I'm doing what I can to, to offer every kind of price range to make everybody happy. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's see if that works. All right, guys, I'm out of here for now, and I'll catch you on the next video.